everyone. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Hold on. We're on camera this time. I okay. gotta like judge my hair. Good. Hair's, hair's good. On. I'm ready. Okay. We're good. Are we good? Okay. Listen, we're so glad that everybody is here today. You all look amazing on this Easter Sunday. We're so thankful that you chose to worship with us today. We'll tell you guys, last week we had an incredible Palm Sunday with over 600 people on campus. Woo woo! It was so incredible. God's doing some amazing things, and we can't wait to see what he's going to do today. Yes, we are so excited you guys are here with us. Happy Easter, everyone. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. We are so excited to worship with you. At this time, we want to ask you guys, since we're welcoming so many visitors, kind of move to the middle so we can make sure all of our late guests have a chance to find a seat. By the way, we know this is second service, but next week we will return to our regularly scheduled one service at 10 a.m. Set your alarms. Don't be late. One service, 10 a.m. starting next Sunday. Yep, it's going to be so incredible, and as we transition into this new season of discipleship and interest groups, we'll actually be postponing Wednesday nights so we can spend time with each other, fellowship, grow, get to know each other a little bit more, so we're going to be taking a break from Wednesday nights through the month of April. Yes, and while we won't be meeting on Wednesday nights, there are still plenty of opportunities to get plugged in for fellowship and other things, from bread making to Bible studies. There's all kinds of interest groups. So to find out about all of those and to stay connected, you can download the Church Center app. Yep, and in the Church Center app, there's so much information about what we do here at the church. And one great way we can find out what we do at the church is through our growth tracks. We'll be kicking our growth track step one on April 14th, and that's where you get to know us, find out about what we do, why we do, and you can check that out on the Church Center app or just scan the QR code wherever you see it. And Growth Track is an awesome first step to getting connected, but in case you're looking for some other opportunities, all the ladies in the house, we will be having Ladies Book Club on Tuesday, April 9th at 6.30 p.m. at the home of Nancy Barnes. Be sure to bring a treat that you can share because we all like to eat. Don't worry, you don't have to have read the book because what happens at Book Club stays at Book Club. Yes, yes. We hear all about book club, so we know how much fun you guys are having. It is a lot of fun. Even all the fun, but the fellas need to have some fun too. So we're going to be kicking off our men's ministry kickoff on Saturday, April 13th at 530. Bring a smoked meat to share, some side dishes, make whatever you bring. Just make sure it's good because I like to eat, so we want to be able to enjoy it. Save the leftovers for the ladies. We also like to eat. No, Rude. no, no, no. Y'all keep the cookies. We get all the stuff. So all right, that's balance fair. it out. That's fair, I guess. We'll, we'll go with it. And by the way, guys, we want to thank you all so much for all that you do to sow back into the kingdom of God. And if you're looking for opportunities to give, we have tons. There are multiple ways to give, including in person, online. You can download the Church Center app, or you can text any dollar amount to 84321. Thank you guys so much. We're looking forward to an incredible service this morning. It's going to be an amazing Sunday. We're so glad that you're here. We're ready to get things kicked off and spend time with fellowship. I want to make a quick plug before we go. If you guys want to come out and support us, the Connection Softball team is having our first game tomorrow night at 630 at Remington Field C1. I believe I got that correct. So make sure to join us. We're having an amazing Sunday. Thank you all for joining us on Easter. I wonder if you know him. Don't try to mislead me. Do you know my king? The Bible says he's a king of the Jews. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. Now that's my king. Well... No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his solar supply. Well, he's enduringly strong. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's impurely powerful. And he's impartially merciful. That's my king. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's preeminent. Well, he's the loftiest idea in literature. 
He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good. He's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He's available for the tempted and the prize. He sympathizes and he saves. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. Do you know him? Do you know my king? Well, my king is a king of knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a gateway of glory. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. His promise is sure. His life is massive. His goodness is limited. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Do you know him? Well, he's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm trying to tell you, the heavens of heaven cannot contain him, let alone a man explain it. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimony to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. He always has been, and he always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor, and he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him, and there'll be nobody after him. You can't even teach him, and he's not going to resign. That's my king. Yeah. Do you know him? He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the popular. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. And he's the lord of lords. That's my king. Describe it, but I can't contain it, can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture, not enough words to ever say what I feel. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy, He is merciful and powerful. Who are we talking about? That's my King. We declare the glory, give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. Jesus, come my king. the rocks cry without joining the chorus there aren't enough notes to make the harmony it's the song of the angels we'll sing through the ages flow in the earth and heaven symphony wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy he is merciful We will adore you 
praise today. Father, we lift our praise to you. We worship you today, Father God. It's your name. It's above all other names. It's at your name. There's victory this morning, Father. And you're worthy, worthy of our praise. darkened and the heavens thundered and for a moment death had thought it conquered but it wasn't over till you said it's over your word is greater still the perfect sacrifice your body broken has you restored to us what sin had stolen once and for all you tore the veil wide open your power is stronger still The grave is still empty, the stone is still round, and you're still high and lifted up, you're still seated on the throne, Come on, church. you're still
can wash away my sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Say what? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Say oh, oh, precious is the blood that makes, that makes me white as snow. The world out I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Because He. Just because he lives, oh, fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future.
good. Let's give the Lord a hand on my praise this morning. Amen. Thank you so, so very much. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for being with us this morning. Happy Easter. Amen. Happy Easter. There you go. Happy Easter back. I love it. Amen. So good to see each and every one of you this morning. I pray that you're all having an excellent day. I will tell you, we are blessed to have an incredible praise team. Thank you so much for all of you that work so much and so very hard to lead us in worship every week. You guys are absolutely incredible. I will tell you that uh, last Sunday was a huge day around this house. And, and I want to tell you, those of you that came and was a part of our Palm Sunday celebration thank you for being a part of that thank you to all of you that worked and volunteered and sacrificed and cleaned up and set up and tore down and manned the grill and set up parking lot cones and parked cars <laughs> thank you so so very much it was a fantastic day we couldn't have done it without you so thank you so so very much for for last week and i'm excited about sharing easter with you today we've already had an incredible service at nine and and I expect the Lord to do something mighty in this service uh, as well. And I will tell you that obviously Easter is the most attended Sunday in church. And so I just want to thank you for choosing our church to spend your Easter with us. Amen. Before I get started, I'm going to share a little quick, a little funny with you. So don't want to get offended. A man took a vacation to Israel with his wife and mother-in-law. And during their time in the Holy Land, his mom-in-law unexpectedly passed away. And the following day, <laughs> the husband met with the local undertaker to discuss the funeral plans. In cases like these, there are a couple of options to choose from, the funeral director told him. And he said, you can ship the body home for $5,000 or you can just bury your mother-in-law in the Holy Land for $150. The man took a minute to think about it, and he announced the decision to ship his mother-in-law home. The undertaker, the funeral director, intrigued by his decision, said, that's an interesting choice. Uh, can I ask you why you would pay the $5,000 to ship your mom-in-law home when you can easily bury her here for $150? The man promptly replied, about 2,000 years ago, a man died and was buried here. Three days later, he rose from the dead. <laughs> And I can't take that chance. Amen? <clears throat> I, I, hopefully, Mama, I love you. I'm, I, that, wasn't, that wasn't a shot at my mother-in-law. Actually, Rob told me to tell the joke for his mother-in-law. But <laughs> I'm just playing. Good to have you this morning. Happy Easter, everybody. You look beautiful. You look awesome. If you'll give me just a minute, I want to share something that's on my heart. And, and uh, hopefully, you'll, you'll get something out of it today. Please turn with me to John chapter 20. In verse 1, you should see on the screen, when you have it or see it, say amen. 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 Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put it or where they've taken him. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped in and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. And while the cloth that they covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. If I say saw and believed. For unto then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead, and then they went home. And the part of this text that really captured my attention was found in verse 7. In the Lululemon translation, it says, While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. And if I could just take you back through this, this portion of scripture real quickly. It is Sunday morning, and Mary Magdalene had come to the tomb to finish anointing Jesus' body for burial. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had only wrapped the body for the burial and laid on Friday before sundown and Jewish custom called for the spices to be added to properly embalm the body and for the burial process. Luke chapter 24 and 10 tells us that in addition to Mary Magdalene, there was Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other women who went to the tomb that morning. 
You see, Jesus was crucified on a Friday, and the reason the women stayed away from the tomb until Sunday morning was that they observed the Passover, or the Sabbath on Saturday. And for three days, the disciples of Jesus grieved. And for three days, those same three days, the chief priests congratulated themselves on finding a way to get rid of this nuisance named Jesus. Their brilliant scheme had now worked. They had rid themselves of this man. For those three same days, the demons in hell celebrated their victory that the Messiah was dead. In verse 2, she ran and found Simon Peter, the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. And these women reported to the 11 apostles that the tomb of Jesus was empty, <laughs> and they didn't know where his body was. In verse 3 and 4, Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb, and they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And Peter and John ran to the tomb because they could not believe what they had heard. It was too amazing for them to conceptualize. They had to see it for themselves. And if you'll just give me just a moment, I want to take our attention to verses 5 through 8 here. And the writer John uses three different Greek words to convey the different types of seeing that these disciples did. In verses 5, the Bible says he stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. And if you look at the Greek phraseology, the word see here, or look, it, it, it gives the connotation of a quick glance, just a, a quick look. You know, uh, John wasn't sure he, he wanted to even enter the tomb. So, 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 so he takes a kind of a cursory kind of, the Greek word for look right here in this instance was kind of a, just a, just a, just kind of a quick see, just kind of a look. Uh, I, don't, I ain't going in there. I ain't, mm -mm, mm -mm, I ain't going. I'm, I'm good. Another one of y'all go in there. I ain't going in there first. I ain't being the first one. And so you go to verse six, and then Simon Peter, he arrived and went inside, and he also noticed or saw the linen wrappings lying there. The Greek word for see or saw right here is a different word than just, just a quick look. This word is the connotation of, of like, y'all remember that, that, that TV show Monk, the, 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 the detective guy? And he would always, he would look at something, he'd walk into a room and you've got these crime shows and these crime movies and these, these doc, and, 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 the, and the detective always walks in and he's, he's just, he's looking around and He's perceiving something to be, to be off, but he can't quite put his finger on it, right? He can't quite figure it out. And, and the connotation that the, the writer uses right here is, is a look that, that is an inquisitive look. It's a look to behold the details of the room. He gazed at what he saw with purpose, and he analyzed it. And he, he, it was like the detective kneeling down, staring at the crime scene and observing the blood splatter direction, the weapon that might have been used. He's trying to draw conclusions to figure out what has happened in this room. He looked, but he was looking to try to figure something out. He hadn't quite put his finger on it yet, but he was still looking. And finally, the third word for saw or to see is in verse 8. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw, but he didn't see just a, cur just a cursory glance. He didn't see just a little look-see. He didn't see as a detective trying to figure out the, the thing that's off in this room. No, the Bible says he saw and believed. He didn't just glance at it. He didn't just observe it with curiosity and detail. He actually began to perceive with intelligent comprehension. He began to discern the facts and faith was beginning to dawn in his mind and in his heart that Jesus' body was not stolen. It was not lost. There was nothing nefarious going on. That Jesus was in fact resurrected and even more importantly was going to return. Amen. There is something happened when he began to see it. For what it was. There were no grave clothes. Or there were grave clothes, but there was no body. In Matthew 28, we are told that the chief priest spread the rumor that Jesus' disciples stole his body. If they had done this, they most likely would have taken the body wrapped in grave clothes rather than leaving the clothes behind. For the disciples of Jesus has no reason to steal the body. They didn't even believe he was going to be resurrected anyway. 
If grave robbers had stolen the body, then they would most likely have taken the grave clothes as well. And we understand that grave clothes left in the tomb are symbols of victory of Jesus over death. Y'all stay with me. For Jesus' resurrected body didn't need any remnants of the past, such as grave clothes, for he was no longer dead. He had defeated death, proving his power over Satan's greatest weapon. The burial clothes were both a symbol of his death and yet at the same time a symbol of his resurrection. It is not recorded in scripture, but I firmly believe that Jesus didn't smell of death in the grave either when he walked and talked with people after his resurrection. There is a beautiful teaching here for you and I too. When you and I are saved by what the cross represents, God removes the sin stains of our past from us, and we are now clothed in righteousness. You see, Satan wants to hold us back and beat us down and continue to clothe us and wrap us with the faults of our past mistakes, but Jesus wants us to live in the presence of his grace and his mercy. That's what Easter is about, us taking the grave clothes off of my body and being wrapped as a new creature in Christ with clothes of righteousness. Amen? The little boy had been very bad and, 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 and naughty and just nasty, and he knew his mother was upset with him. And the family had a chalkboard in the kitchen for messages, and the little boy wrote on the board, Mother, when you forgive me, erase this message. He went to his room and thought long and hard about what he had done. And about an hour later, he went to the kitchen and kind of peeked over at the, at the chalkboard. And to his delight, his mother had erased his message and had even taken a cloth and washed the board completely clean that there would be no remnant of the chalk line behind it. And you and I must understand that Jesus, like this little boy's mother, doesn't want to just give a, a, an eraser to our sins so that you can almost kind of still see it. Some, no, he wants to take it and wash it completely clean, erase our sins out of our life. Amen? That's what Easter is really about today. The fact that the grave clothes were folded and they were neat is a reminder that our God does not do things in random or inconsistent manners. You see, there was a plan to resurrect Jesus, and it was executed flawlessly. For God pays attention to every detail, even the folding of the burial cloth. For God is also concerned with the details of your and my life as well. There might be small answers, but he, was, he will always listen to us and show us that he is there with us. The grave clothes were not thrown on the floor, floor as if in some sort of haste or hurry. They were in King James Version, wrapped, or the New Living Translation, folded. They, they, they were intentional and designed purposely to be folded for a reason. We understand that, that he folded them and walked completely by himself out of his grave. It's important we understand this. Typically, that does not happen. In John 11 and 43, we find another guy that's been buried, a guy named Lazarus. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound in grave clothes. Imagine that. His face wrapped in a headcloth. And Jesus tells them, unwrap him and let him go. I want you to understand and get this picture. There's a guy named Lazarus that Jesus says, hey, I want you to come out of the grave. Jesus answer, or Lazarus answers the call of Jesus, and he comes out of the grave. Kind of like a, a mummy, if you would. He's wrapped up. He's, he's bound. He's encumbered. He's, he's, he's still held hostage to, to the things of his past. There, there's been an answer to a call. Thank God for the answer to the call. But there's still not true deliverance yet. You, you must understand this. There's a lot of us that answer the call of Jesus. And he says, hey, come out of your past. Come out of your grave. And we're like, hey, I'm coming out. But we're still not free yet. We're still not bound. We're still bound by the things that hold us back. And he says, he tells the other people in his life, he says, unwrap him. Unwrap him. Because if he's a follower of me, he's no longer in need of the things that encumber him. I need you all to catch this real quickly. There's a lot of us that, that, that subscribe to the, the, the common and the, and the modern church and just hang in here. Just, I'm not going to offend nobody. But there's this, there's this, I 
I don't know what to call it. Paradigm. Mentality. That Jesus loves you so much. <laughs> and, and he loves you so much that you can profess Christianity. You can say I'm a follower. You can say I love Jesus. You can even go to church every now and then. And you can profess this lifestyle but still walk around in grave clothes. How dumb is that? He said, I need you to understand something. When you answer the call, there needs to be a church somewhere, a youth group somewhere, a women's group somewhere, a men's group somewhere, a small group somewhere, a group of body of believers somewhere that can help assist you in getting the old dead mess off of your life so you can begin to walk in freedom. It's not of God's will for you to answer a call and still be bound. What point of it is it for you to walk out of your cave, to walk out of your tomb, to walk out of your grave, but still be bound by the very thing that was in your grave with you? No, get some people around your life that say, hey, let me help you out, honey. Let me begin to unwrap some things off of your life. Let me begin to speak truth in life over you. Now, it's important to understand this. Could you imagine this for a moment? Here's Lazarus. He's bound, right? He's got, he's got stuff all over his face. He can't see. I, just hang in. Just let me do me. He can't see nothing. And he's bumping into, in the, in the, into the side of the, of the grave. And he's bumping in. He's tripping over headstones. And he's in the graveyard. He don't know where to go. Don't know what to do. And, and he's like, hey, Jesus. Like, oh, oh, stop, Lazarus. Just, just hang out. I've got a body of believers with you that's going to help you get unencumbered. Sounds great, right? But what if the people he asked to help them get un unencumbered are blinded by the same grave clothes themselves? Imagine that picture for a moment. You've got the blind literally trying to lead the blind. You've got people trying to help each other become unencumbered and become, become free and become a life full of Jesus Christ, but we're still dealing with the same stuff. Let me tell you something. I believe a church should be set apart. I believe a body of believers should be set apart. I believe that, that if you live a Christian life, there should be something different about you. I believe you should think a little bit clearer. I think you should act a little bit different. I think God should impart to you a little bit of wisdom and knowledge and, and goodness. I think you should be set apart. I, I believe in holiness. I believe in sanctification. I believe in unwrapping the dead clothes off of my life so that when I can see, now I can help you see. You see, there's a problem in the American church today that says just come how you are, but just leave how you are. No, no, no. Come how you are, but leave free. But leave unencumbered. But leave delivered. But leave on set on fire for God. Amen? Woo. I didn't, I didn't, it's Easter. I ain't supposed to preach on Easter. Y'all just hang on. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. <laughs> I, here we go. I'm gonna, I'm, before this over, Lynn, I'm going to offend somebody. I don't mean to. If you want to come here, we want you here. We need you here. I love, I, well, I'll find chairs for you. I'll, I'll put brackets on the wall. We'll figure out somewhere to put you. Come, please come. But if you don't want to leave here different, this ain't the right church. And I don't mean to be offensive. But if you want to come here and still be the same way you've always been for the next 10 years, you've got the wrong preacher and you got the wrong church because I'm not gonna sleep and I'm not gonna quit trying and I'm not gonna quit preaching and I'm not gonna quit pulling and I'm not gonna quit having altar calls. Why? Because we're gonna do everything we can to make sure we're a body of believers that are unwrapping the grave clothes off of each other so that we can be free from our sin and free from our past, amen? Let's give the Lord a hand cup of praise for that. In the heart of this glorious Easter season, we gather to celebrate not just the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but the profound message of transformation and the renewal it brings to each one of us. The empty tomb on Easter morning is more than just a historical fact. It is a symbol of Jesus' victory over death and sin, a victory he shares with all who believe in him. I will tell you, if you recall from earlier, grave clothes left in the tomb were not merely remnants of Christ's resurrection but they are victorious banners that proclaim his triumph over death. Now consider this. The grave clothes that we as followers of Christ wear symbolize the sins that so easily entangle our lives. 
But something happens when we take inventory of our lives and begin to intentionally and decisively fold the grave clothes into a monument. For then they become emblems of our victory in life with Jesus, a testament to the power of his resurrection manifesting in us. This call to freedom is not just about individual liberation. It's a communal effort. I can't help you get unwrapped unless I'm, st- or unless I'm unwrapped. This statement underscores the interconnectedness of our spiritual journeys. We are called to mutual support, to be both recipients and yet givers of grace, helping each other to cast aside the grave clothes that bind us. Hebrews 12 and 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, comma, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. This passion is a, a passage is a clarion call to us all. It reminds us that we're not solitary runners, but part of a great cloud of witnesses. People that have already ran this race and are now cheering us on from the sidelines. Together we are called to lay aside every encumbrance, especially the sins of our lives, and run with perseverance the race that's been marked out for us. As we celebrate Easter this morning, let me, let me just help us. Let us remember the folded grave cloth as a symbol of our own victory over sin through Jesus Christ. Let us commit to helping one another remove our grave clothes, to live in the freedom that Christ has already won for us. May we embrace the full significance of the cross, understand that it not only signifies Christ's victory over death, but also offers a path to freedom from the sins that entangle us. When we leave out of here today, you'll hear a song playing. Maverick City song, and I'm not going to sing it. I'll I'll spare you the details. It says, well, I walked out of my grave clothes, and I came out in a new robe. I was buried there for too long. Now I come alive in the one who has conquered it all. He breathed in me, made these dry bones come alive. He conquered death because he did it. I can do it too. Jesus, my Savior, you are my Savior. You saved us. He slayed my giants and he crushed my enemy. He closed the, closed the mouth of lions and because he did it, I can do it too. I walked out of my grave clothes and I came out in a new robe. The burial clothes were a symbol of his death and yet at the same time became a symbol of his resurrection. I will tell you that I'm going to offer this up to you and a lot of your theology might be rocked in just a moment. I would like to present to you today an incredible argument can be made that the most profound imagery, the most profound representation of Easter might not just be only the cross. If you think of Easter, you think of the cross. Can I add a piece to your imagery today? Can I add something to your memory bank today? I believe the cross certainly represents the brutal sacrifice of our Lord, but the folded grave cloth gives us understanding that the one on the cross wasn't just a man. He wasn't just a thief like the other crosses. There is something different about this cross. You see, he wasn't just a man, but in fact, he was God manifested in flesh. He has already overcome death, he's overcome hell, and he's overcome the grave. And so can we. He is alive today. He is alive forevermore, and you and I can live in that same freedom forevermore. Something happens when we fold our cloths. Something happens. When I take inventory of my life, Justin, a lot of our sins won't just fall off of us. A lot of our addictions don't just go away. 
A lot of the issues and the, and the problems that we go through, the Bible says they easily beset us. And a lot of us are waiting for something to happen so that we can become that new creature in Christ almost by osmosis. But what if it takes intentionality? What if it takes deliberation? What if it takes me looking in the mirror and saying, what specifically am I dealing with that I don't want to deal with anymore? What specifically has become part of my identity that I must take authority over? What is it about my life that I'm identifying myself with that's part of my past and I don't want to be identified by that thing anymore? What happens when you take your grave cloth? You begin to fold it. You begin to have intentionality about it. I'm going to tell you what happened. There comes a moment in your life when you no longer have this a part of you, but it's by you. And there'll be people come in your life that say, Rob, just kind of look at Rob. Eh, kind of looked at him. You'll have people come in your life and go, mm, there's something, there's something. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a monk now. There's something different. I can't figure it out. I can't, I can't figure, there's something different. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I'm going to try to look at your life to ascertain what's happening, but I can't quite figure it out. But there'll be some people that'll look at your life and see it. And because they see it, they begin to believe in the one that has set you free. A lot of us don't know how to witness. How do I win somebody to Christ? How do I show the love of Christ to others? How can I be a, a soul winner? How, what Bible study can I teach? Do I, do I go to lunch? Do I do this? Do I have a track? Do I, do I, do I, set, do I carry the biggest Bible I possibly can through my school? What, what can I do to somehow show Jesus to others? Can I present to you, it's your grave call. Can I present to you the greatest evangelistic methodology we have at our disposal? Is the folding of our own grave cloth. Instead of trying to justify why we're still wearing it. Instead of saying, well, I don't think it's that big a deal. Instead of saying, well, I mean, it's, it's relevant. It, that might have been for another day. Instead of saying, well, I will go to this church because that church don't preach against it. I'm sorry, I went there, sorry. Instead of saying, I'm going to just try to find a way to coexist with my past because, I mean, that's, that's really who I am. I'm this way because my daddy was this way. I'm this way because my mama was this way. Or what if we just take it and take some time with it and fold it up and say, this is no longer for me. This no longer fits me. This no longer has any being with me, but when you come and see it, you're going to know that I'm a new creature in Christ. And let me tell you about a man named Jesus that died on a cross for you so that you could have everlasting life. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Dr. Seamans tells a Muslim who became a Christian in Africa. And some of his friends asked him, why have you become a Christian? He answered, well, it's like this. Suppose you're going down the road and suddenly the road forked in two different directions and you didn't know which way to go. And there at this fork were two guys and they were gonna give you directions. One was dead and one was alive. Who are you gonna ask directions from? Can I tell you he's alive today? Can I tell you that the folded napkin or the folded cloth today was to let those know that were coming to the tomb, hey, look, man, I haven't been stolen. Nothing nefarious has went on. Nothing bad is going on. No grave robbers got to me. I took the time to intentionally fold my grave cloth 
for you to know that I have waged victory over death, hell, and the grave. Amen? Let's all stand this morning. My grave clothes. Can I tell you that grave clothes can be emotions? I got time. I got, I got time. I can meddle just for a minute. It's 12.04. I got you for another few minutes. Watch this. Because this ain't in notes. When it, when it ain't in notes, y'all better buckle up. This ain't in no my notes. Can I tell you grave clothes can be emotions? Can I tell you grave clothes can be way, the way you perceive people? the way you think about things, your distrust of people, your lack of empathy, your lack of intimacy, your lack of vulnerability. Well, I can't because I've been hurt. I can't because this is bad to happen. I can't be that. I can't do that. I can't walk in that. I can't go there. Can I tell you that's a grave clothes? Can you fold it up? and be a new creature in Christ? Can you take it off and stop worrying about what it felt like to have it around you like a little blankie forever? If we're not careful, if we're not careful, our past becomes comfortable to us. If we're not careful, our past hurts and our past disappointments become justification for us to live in bitterness. We're justified being angry. We're justified being nasty. We're justified being mean and ugly. But is this really who you are? Could you imagine Jesus? I know all the men in here, I'm sure all of our men in here, they, they know how to fold sheets, right? Could you imagine Jesus folding a sheet? Could you imagine that? Could you imagine him? Man, I don't know if it goes this way or this way. He, he's being resurrected. He's... he's I'm, I'm God manifested in flesh. I, I, don't, I don't have time to fold a, what am I doing? Why, why am I doing this? Because it serves as a monument of victory. It serves as a representation of victory. Could you imagine it this way? Them suckers thought they had me. I wish a sucker would. They thought they had me. They thought they was going to kill the lamb. But all they did was unleash the lion of the tribe of Judah. Don't they understand who I was? Don't they get who I am? And when you and I begin to fold the grave clothes of our life, we're simply saying, I've been buried with him, but I'm being resurrected with him just the same. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise all over this house. Thank you, buddy. It's good, ain't it? I like that. All right, now we're just going to open these altars. If you would like to pray, I, there's a couple, two, couple people in this room right now. There's, there's, there's one, this person's in the room, that says, I can't let Easter go by without saying thank you, Lord, for Easter. When it says, I will cherish the old rugged cross, you're talking to me because I'm going to cherish the old rugged cross. And I'm going to embrace the old rugged cross. And I'm going to thank God for what Easter means for me. There might be another person in this room that does this. That says, you know what? I've been walking with gray clothes way too long. I've been walking with identity of death way too long. For the wages of sin is death. And I've been walking and justifying and coexisting with sinful behaviors and sinful actions. But I'm ready to walk out of this place as a new creature in Christ. Amen. So as Lynn begins to sing this song, we're going to open our altars. If you would like to pray, I would love to pray with you in the mighty name of Jesus.
nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Help us right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Something happens when we take the time to be deliberate and intentional with our life. Something powerful happens. Something incredible happens. When we take the time to be specific about areas of our life that we need God to be in charge of and have authority of. Incredible things happen. There's nothing wrong with being specific. Let your needs be known. Specifically pray. I, I've, I've often dealt, and I'm, I'm, give me two minutes. I've often dealt with people with, they couldn't forgive themselves or they had unforgiveness in their heart or they repented of sins. And they said, Lord, just forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. And while I believe in that blanket covering, a lot of times they walked out of that not really feeling free and forgiven and something as simple as hey listen I ain't got to be the one to be around you when you do this but when you begin to verbalize Lord forgive me of X forgive me of Y forgive me of Z what you're doing is you're taking the grave cloth off of your life and you're taking some time to intentionally and deliberately begin to fold it up and saying it no longer has any hold over me it no longer has any authority over me it no longer is identified with this I'm setting this to the side and I'm making it a monument of my victory through Christ Jesus amen let's give the Lord one more hand up of praise thank you so much if you're a guest in the house today we welcome you to Easter. We, we pray that you walk out of here blessed and highly favor the Lord. I thank you so much for being a part and on behalf of, of, of me and my family, happy Easter. We love you. Pastor Justin, if you'll come and, and dismiss us, let's, let's give him a hand as he comes. Amen. Love you. All right. We are absolutely delighted that you would spend this Lord's Day, this Resurrection Sunday. Hasn't it been a wonderful, wonderful day. Aren't you glad when somebody told you, let's go into the house of the Lord. We want to thank you all for 
being here with us. I do want to take just a quick moment. If you've made a decision in your life, or perhaps you would just like to connect with us for some more information, take a moment, grab a Connect card. You'll find it in one of these seat back pockets. Complete that for us. Uh, drop that in any of the secure boxes, and we're going to uh, be able to send you a little information that we would like to uh, take a moment and do that with you. So again, thank you all so much for joining us today. Let's pray a, a quick prayer of dismissal. Holy Spirit, we love you and we thank you so much for uh, what you are doing here today, Lord, how, how you are stirring, uh, Father, in, in these hearts today, Lord. Lord, we know that today is a day of victory. Lord, let us look upon those folded grave clothes in the tomb and see the resurrection and see it and believe it today. Lord, I, I think of the, the parable that you shared with us about the, the prodigal son that found himself in a, an old pig pen. and He must have been smelly and had a lot of, a lot of just stained up clothes. And, and, and it goes on to, to say that, that you told us that, that the father in this story saw the son coming from a long way off and it says that you ran you ran and, and you didn't just put on any kind of robe you put on the best robe that you have and you gave him the signet ring lord don't let us stay in our sin today don't let us be satisfied in sin of the grave clothes lord let us put those down and clothe ourselves in Christ today and in the overcoming victory that is found in you. We thank you for that. We honor you for that today, Lord. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you all so much for joining us. You may be dismissed. Happy, happy Easter.